Welcome to the Donna Show. I'm Noah Donish, and today we have a very special guest, Mayor John Mirsch. Thank you so much for joining me, Mayor. Thank you for having me, Noah. So, I'm going to start off by asking, what are your duties as mayor here in Beverly Hills? So, the mayor is one of five council members. We're actually now four because one of our council members moved to Texas. Um, and the mayor is largely a ceremonial role. The mayor um, runs the meetings, the mayor sets the agendas, mm -hmm. the mayor sometimes represents the city outside uh, the council, but the mayor's vote doesn't count any more than any other council members. Mm -hmm. And why did you decide to become mayor? So you're, ele you're, city council well, you're elected to the council first and then you rotate. It goes to the, there's a sort of a set rotation that go goes according to seniority and how many votes you got in the last election. So why I ran for council almost eight years ago was I'd lived abroad for a number of years and I moved back to Beverly Hills. I grew up here, went to Hawthorne and then Beverly. And I, I felt the city wasn't moving in the right direction. I felt that it was changing and there's nothing wrong with change, but there is something wrong with bad change. And I, I felt it wasn't changing in good ways. And so I started off by writing a blog which was critical of certain things that were happening within the city. Uh, friends encouraged me to run and here I am. Other than being mayor, what else do you do? So my background is in film distribution, and I uh, have done that for a number of years internationally as well. Uh, but right now, this is taking up most of my time. <laughs> and what's your favorite part as being mayor of Beverly Hills? Well, it's, it's wonderful when you're able to get something done. And you need, it's not just as the mayor you get something done. It's if you have an idea or a vision and work together with the other council members to, to make it happen, and you're able to improve the quality of life and... Uh, the city for the residents. That's wonderful when, when you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Where do you see Beverly Hills going in the next few years? Well, here's the thing is th there's that old expression, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. There's always something that can be better. There's also an expression, nothing so good it can't be better. But mm -hmm. beyond the cliches, I, I'd love to see us retain our unique uh, community feeling that we have. Beverly Hills is 35,000 people. We're in the middle of a a metropolitan area with almost 20 million people, Southern California. But when you live in Beverly Hills, you have a sense of home, a sense of place, a sense of belonging, and that's very special. And I'd like for us to retain that. Part of it is is the physical makeup of our city. We're you know still a a residential community, very low rise, very accessible, walkable, and human scale. And I hope mm -hmm. we stay that way. And while keeping with the past, we are innovating a lot, one of which is the autonom autonomous vehicle mm -hmm. you guys are working on. So can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Well, about a year ago, I wrote an article in the LA Business Journal outlining um, a, a new form of municipal transportation, and that would be shuttle systems based on autonomous vehicle technology, a municipal autonomous shuttle system. And this past April 5th, the council... Um, something that we that I proposed and we passed a resolution very unanimously and very um, enthusiastically to support the development uh, of, of this. So basically what it would be, it would be on-demand, point-to-point transportation within the city, take you where you want to go, from where you want to go, whenever you want to go, and it would be based on autonomous vehicles, meaning driverless cars, <laughs> except it would be a shuttle system. And so uh, we, we feel that this would do a number of things. We, we think it would solve the first and last mile challenge for the subway. So if you don't live within walking distance of the subway when it opens in 2023, how are you going to get there? There's no parking spaces. Um, you know, some people may bike. That's great. Uh, but this will, will help solve that. It will also provide mobility for seniors, for disabled people, for blind people, for kids, for students as well. Uh, and it'll allow people to leave their cars at home. And the more people that leave their cars at home, the better off we will be because that means less traffic. Mm -hmm. So this can solve all sorts of problems, in addition to which we're looking at layering on technology. We would have uh, automatic license plate readers on top of these vehicles which could tell us if there is a warrant for a, someone's arrest or a, a stolen vehicle. We could have closed circuit cameras that could alert the police if there was suspicious activity. On the bottom of these vehicles we could have sensors that let our public works department know if uh, uh, you know there's a pothole which fortunately there are not a lot of in Beverly Hills and and maybe even to help clean the streets. So there, there's there's a lot that we can do and but the main reason that this, I think, is going to be so 
revolutionary and why we're so exciting about it is because it transforms public transportation. Today, public transportation is a second-class form of transportation. You use it only if you have to. You don't have another choice. You don't have a car. You can't drive whatever reason. And you have to adapt to the system, and it's not always easy. You have to figure out what line's going to take you, where you want to go, where you maybe need to switch. Uh, you need to get to a station, and then you need to, you're on their timetable. You need to wait for the, the bus or, or vehicle to show up. We're turning that on its head. We're proposing something that will come to you when you want and where you want and take you where you want to go. And that, I think, will mean that public transportation for many people in many situations will become the natural, logical first choice. And what's exciting is, is that is a that represents a true democratization of public transportation. It puts everyone on the same level, and, and that's, that's wonderful. That's what public transportation should be. Yeah, I really feel it would re revolutionize the whole city as a whole. Yeah. And do you have an expected date that you want this to be completed by? It's interesting. Um, we certainly want it to be done by the time the first subway station opens at La Cienega in Wilshire, and that's scheduled to open in 2023. Mm -hmm. But we think, I mean, that's seven years away. We think this is going to be ready for prime time way before then. And so uh, we're not waiting for that. And uh, we feel that beyond first and last mile solutions, this offers transportation solutions within the city. So we'd love to be part of a pilot program. We are the first city in the U.S. to have passed a resolution specifically with this goal of integrating autonomous vehicle technology into public transportation. And we think it could be here considerably before when the subway opens in 2023. Mm -hmm. And then you also touched on the biking. You guys recently opened mm -hmm. a public biking mm -hmm. system. Could you also? Well, it's wonderful. It's something I've been pushing for for a number of years. And sometimes it's true the wheels of government work very slowly. But we finally have a bike share program. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we now need to focus on is beefing up the biking infrastructure within the city and making the city a bike-friendly place. Uh, one thing that I'm personally invested in is we're redoing Santa Monica Boulevard. It needs to be rebuilt. And I feel absolutely there need to be dedicated bike lanes there. Mm -hmm. I think that would offer us an east-west connection to West Hollywood on the one side and Los Angeles on the other. And that would be a great start. And what was the goal of bringing these bikes to the city? I think it was to encourage people to, you know, use bikes, but it's what we call multimodal transportation. Use the bike, walk, discover the city in that way, and uh, leave your cars at home. And we're, we're blessed with some amazing weather. Normally it doesn't rain here, and other cities that have worse weather have had much success with these bike share programs. So we're not early adopters when it comes to the bike share program as opposed to the autonomous vehicle program. Mm -hmm. And you've also been working a lot throughout your tenure as on city council and mayor. What do you think is your primary goal throughout this whole tenure? So I don't have one specific goal, but really I do have a guiding philosophy, and it's it hasn't changed at all. My goal is to put the residents first in every decision that is made, because I believe that the residential quality of life is the key for the success of the city, and it's the reason we live here. And because it is our home, and home is almost a sacred concept, we need to focus on the people who call Beverly Hills their home first. And so my goal is always to put the residents first. And what are some of your favorite accomplishments that you have done so far? Well, we've done a number of things, but one thing that's fantastic is our general plan continues to envision that the city will continue as a low-rise, human-scale uh, community. And uh, so that's wonderful. Another thing that I'm uh, very pleased about is that we're finally going to open our first dog park in, uh, in this fall, or maybe actually the end of the summer. Uh, it's something that has been in discussion for a long time, but at a council level, I first proposed it in 2010, I believe. And finally, it's gained traction. And I have to give uh, uh, Lily Bossy, who's a colleague, credit. When she was mayor, it's something that she took charge of and pushed, and I, I helped her with that, and we're finally going to open that, and that's wonderful. I'd like to see more green space. Um, I'd like to see where the dog park is. We have another four-plus acres. I'd like to see green space, a people park there of four-plus acres, so I'm going to work on that. But uh, another thing that I'm, pr another accomplishment that I think that the council uh, achieved over the past few years that I've been a part of that is wonderful is we instituted a cultural heritage commission. There was really before that no way to protect uh, any kinds of, or protect or honor any kinds of 
uh, architecturally significant buildings. And we now have a registry with almost 30 properties on it. It's continuing, and I do believe that our history is key to our future. And we probably in the past have not done a good enough job in honoring it and valuing it, and that is changing. Mm -hmm. And through the dog park, we could see how hard it is to get something uh, going through the government system. What do you think, what are the, some of the biggest challenges you face? Well, there, there are always opposed interests and opposing interests. And sometimes it's neighbors who oppose other neighbors for various reasons. And sometimes it's businesses that oppose uh, residents or residents that oppose businesses. Uh, part of democracy is, in many cases, trying to reach a compromise on something. Now, that's not the same thing as compromising core principles. There are certain things that, you know, we say we're uncompromising and mean that that's, that's something good. Well, in certain cases, that is true. But in other cases, this is the whole democratic system, is working out something that everyone can live with. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe everyone's equally unhappy in, in, in a certain way, but that's that kind of compromise is the foundation of democracy. And so that's something that we work on as well as trying to bring together opposing interests and figure out solutions that ultimately will work. Mm -hmm. And how do you uh, communicate and collaborate with other cities around us? There are a number of local boards that, you know, that, that we have in addition to personal communications I have with other council members. There's the West Side Council of Governments, which I'm our delegate on. There's the League of California Cities. There's something with the uh, uh, acronym SCAG, which doesn't sound so great, but it stands for the Southern California Association of Governments. And so there are various forums for local cities to work together. In Los Angeles County alone, including LA, there are 88 cities. And so uh, we have, in many cases, very common interests. Uh, some cases they're divergent, but I think our main uh, uniting goal is that we want to have local control. We want to be able to decide what's right for our city, for our residents, and we don't want the state dictating to us or, for that matter, taking our money. <laughs> and so we've seen all the troubles and you explained how you get through them. What happens when you come up against someone who has opposing ideas? What do you, what's your advice as to coming across that? You always have to listen. People, you have to try and understand where other people are coming from. And if you, you don't know, you ask them. I mean, dialogue is extremely important. Ultimately, you may not come to an agreement, but at least understanding somebody, assuming that they have a, at least semi-rational position, is important. Uh, and, and that's the goal, is to, to, you know, to be able to communicate and to be able to under, have mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. And now coming over to education, do you have any plans as to improving our education here in Beverly Hills? Well, you know, as you're aware, our area of not only expertise but of, of responsibility doesn't include the schools. We have a school board which is elected by our residents to determine school policy and, and that sort of thing. Clearly I have ideas. I, I have a son who's a, a third grader at Horace Mann and I, I'm, as mentioned, a graduate of our school systems. Uh, the city, however, does have what's known, known as a joint powers agreement with the schools where we use the school facilities for the community and the school gets a significant sum of money and uh, they can use that for programming and for for their own needs and that's something that will continue mm -hmm. and most of the income that comes into the city where does that go where do you see that going at this point so most of the revenue that goes into the city our biggest single expense is salaries and benefits of our employees mm -hmm. and quite frankly while i do feel our employees should have fair and uh, competitive and sustainable salaries and benefits in many cases, I feel that um, especially our, the pensions that we're offering our employees are just not sustainable, and in many cases not fair either. And this is a problem not just unique to Beverly Hills. It's a problem uh, that we have throughout the state in municipalities when it comes to public employees. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's a problem. It's a mathematical problem. It's not a Democratic. It's not a Republican problem. It's a mathematical one that we're going to have to solve. Mm -hmm. So my next thing is coming back to you. Hmm? What was your job as a, you were executive at Paramount? I was executive at Paramount. Before that, I ran the uh, uh, office in Sweden of United International Pictures. Film distribution, in brief, what that is, is especially if you work for a studio, you market and date and sell the movies uh, of a studio. And you work with local exhibitors and getting them in the theaters and you try and promote it through trailer placement, through advertising, and it's, it's essentially after you're 
given a movie what how to make the most out of it. Now, in many cases, especially since the international market is growing and growing, uh, the studios in making the movie seek the input of the executives, and that makes a lot of sense, because when I started, the international market was maybe only 30% of the worldwide revenue. Now it's maybe closer to 70%. And what got you involved into this film industry? Well, growing up in Beverly Hills, and you know, a lot of people here worked in the film industry, and it was a natural interest, although when I did start out, I was also interested in living abroad, so it was a, it was a nice combination. How do you feel Sweden is compared to here in the United States? Sweden's wonderful. There, there are a lot of similarities, uh, but there are also a lot of differences. Uh, you know, it's hard to just boil it down to a few, but I'll tell you that the qualities that I love about Sweden, and these are values that I share and uh, probably have you know, become even more pronounced in me since having lived in Sweden and, and becoming a Swedish citizen. Uh, the Swedes have a sense of tolerance, of fairness. Fairness really matters. Uh, you know, when we grew up here, kids always say uh, something's not fair, and their parents tend to remark, well, life's not fair. You know, fortunately, I've never said that not once to my son. But my feeling is we have to try and make it fair, at least as fair as it can be. Swedes have a love of nature and a respect for nature. Um, there are many other wonderful qualities. Equality is, is something that is quite natural in Sweden, the equality between men and women. And uh, it's a very egalitarian society when it comes to that. And uh, just, just, you know, it's a wonderful place. And it's, I'm, I feel lucky because not only is Beverly Hills my home, but Sweden is as well. So that's all the time we have for today. So I have one last question. Sure. What is one quote that you try to live by? Well, it's maybe one of two. One might be from Shakespeare, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day that thou cannot be false to any man. And the other one is, it's time for Dodger baseball. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank for you so much. Today. Thank you. And I've been Noah Donish. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much.